Hello there, returning subscribers. I'm Black Bright, and thank you so much for um, keeping up with me and um, for responding and your comments and all those kind of things. As usual, if you like the video, you put the thumbs up. If you don't, put the thumbs down, you subscribe, you share. Um, I call this video, Don't Cast a Shadow After Dark, um, and Deprivation of Citizenship. And why would I put those two things together? Well, don't cast your a shadow after dark is a Jamaican saying, and its exact meaning is don't be too eager to make assumptions when the situation is uncertain. Now, what would that have to do with deprivation of citizenship? Well, I woke up with that title, don't cast your shadow after dark. I didn't really, I'd heard it, I didn't know what it meant. And then I was looking through my emails and I noticed something from Richmond Chambers and it was about deprivation of citizenship. And I'm like, what, what have these two things got in common? Well, the thing is, there's different reasons why people have, are deprived of their citizenship. But in the article I was reading and the one that's the subject of this video, um, it's about somebody who made an assumption that because they have their naturalisation, they could live their life as normal, not realising that because they'd acquired their citizenship based on misrepresentation, it could be taken away. So that's the reason for the title. So um, I'll refer to my notes. Um, many people have obtained their citizenship based on misrepresentation and believe they could get away with it. If a situation is based on a lie, misrepresentation, the outcome will always be uncertain. I don't like to think that an asylum seeker came to the UK to deliberately pull the wool over the Home Office's eyes, but this person obtained his British citizenship based on an identity that was partially correct. He is now an adult in his early 40s. He decides to get married. His fiance lives in Albania. So I'm just going to tell you quickly a rough summary of what happened. Um, a gentleman comes over um, in late 1990s, claims he's 15, which means he's an unaccompanied adult, claims he's from Kosovo, because Kosovo was at war at the time with the Serbs, and he, um, I think that was the two main reasons why he got exceptional leave to remain because under the UNHCR, the UK have an obligation to protect unaccompanied minors. So as he was 15, he was an unaccompanied minor. He came into the country. He got um, a special leave to remain. Then he got his indefinite leave to remain in 2000. And then he naturalised in 2005 as an adult by now, because he's I think he's 44 now. Um, what happens then is he decides to get married to somebody from Albania. And in, in going for, in, in, you know, in collating documentation, the birth, certificate, the birth certificate shows that he was born in Albania, not Kosovo, that he was um, born the 11th of April, 19. 78 not 1982 which made which made him an adult because he was over 18 when he came to the UK back in 1998 so um so he basically got his British citizenship based on false information now what he's saying is is that his parents told him he was born in Kosovo and what his parents are saying is that they said that they told him that because they were killing Albanians. 
We don't know if that's true or false. Um, so he claims that he sincerely believed he was born in Kosovo, even though when they asked him for paperwork from his school, he couldn't show any. So, and he also believed he was younger. I don't know why. It's hard to believe that somebody um, coming from a different country would know about the difference an age makes, i.e. the fact that you're 15 would give you more protection than if you're 19, where you might not have any, and would actually come to the UK, deliberately say you're 15, and deliberately say you're from a country that's undergoing war, you don't have no ID, so the Home Office is just reliant on what you tell them. They probably think, okay, this person doesn't speak English, they don't really know the law, so therefore they must be telling the truth. But it's hard to believe that somebody would be calculating like that, deliberately underage themselves in order to get protection, and then go through the whole gamut of applying to stay in the country under those under that false information, only to be only for it to be revealed several years later when he decides to get married. So he is now an adult in his early forties. He decides to get married. His fiance lives in Albania. He needs to sponsor her. To sponsor her, he needs to prove who he is and that is that he is legitimately in the UK. To do this, he needs his birth certificate and other documentation. He claims at this point, 2006, when he received his birth certificate, it is only then he realised he was not born in Kosovo and he was not born in 1982, but 1978. I wonder why he didn't get his birth certificate before. Uh, anyway, I'm surprised that his birth certificate wasn't required before. I mean, if he was able to get it now, what prevented him from getting it before? Or was the motivation less? He wanted to marry this woman so much that he went out of his way to look for the birth certificate. I'm just thinking out loud. So the Home Office therefore deprived him of his British citizenship because he obtained it based on fraudulent information. Section 40, brackets 3 of the British Nationality Act 1983, and he is now, well, he has been appealing their decision. He went to the first tier tribunal where the judge conducted a merits-based assessment, concluding that family and private life, which is Article 8, did not outweigh the public interest in deprivation. In simple words, the amount of time he spent in the UK living a life developing a family, I don't know if he's got kids or whatever, but it didn't outweigh public interest or the lies he told to get his citizenship because, you know, they say every liar is a thief and every thief is a liar. So you might say, okay, I'm not a terrorist, but the fact that you lied and you reinforced that lie could mean that you could do anything basically and I think that's the way they look at it people might look at lies as something very superficial and something not very important but when it comes to you acquiring citizenship based on a lie that's a big deal and then you not only lie once like when you first come here and you're applying for you're an asylum seeker um, applying for refugee status and it's not only that but you also Lied, you, you had to reinforce that lie when you um, applied for exceptional leave to remain, indefinite leave to remain, and, you're natural, and you, when you were naturalised. So it just shows you how you have to keep on lying and how those lies can get bigger and bigger over time. So anyway, um, his case then goes to the upper tribunal because it was thrown out. If that one. Um, his case then goes to the upper tribunal where he tries to rely on a previous policy where the Secretary of State would not normally deprive a person of their citizenship if they had been in the UK for more than 14 years unless it is in the public 
interest to deprive them. The problem here is that what is deemed to be in the public interest, and like I said, the lying um, can amount to anything. Some people kill because of a lie. Some people, and they kill to hide a lie. So you don't know where that lie is going to lead. So when you're saying, is it in the public interest? How many people are going to protect? Because when you, it's like when people blackmail, you know, you end up killing. Some people end up killing the blackmailer. You don't know how big it's going to get. How many more, how many people are going to be involved? What you have to do to protect that lie. And that's when it becomes in the public interest. Um, so, um, the court found it unmeritorious, which meant it was without merit. So, he couldn't rely on the previous policy, not to deprive just because he'd been in the country for 14 years, basically. The judge, ha the judge has to deduce whether a person's citizenship was acquired by means of false representation, i.e., whether... It were, you were aware of that force of the information you're giving or you were unaware. Did he believe his parents? Is it true that his parents lied to him? Did he fabricate the information deliberately? Would he know that by saying he was an unaccompanied minor, it would bring with him certain privileges, i.e. protection under the domestic legislation and international agreements, UNHCR? Number two. Concealment. This is what the judge has to has to deduce. So number one is false representation. Number two is concealment. Did he deliberately conceal his true age and place of birth? Or did he really not know? In the Caribbean, um, I don't know about now it's different because they have bedside registration. But back when I was born, you were born on one day and he was registered on another day. Sometimes it took goodness knows how long for a parent to register you. So you, some people had two dates of birth, the date they was actually born and the date they were actually registered. So, and some parents lie about where their parents, you know, where their children grew up for whatever reason. So I'm just saying that because I don't know if it's a legitimate, it's legitimate for his parents for him to say that his parents lied to him about his age and where he was born. Because if it's a sim if it's similar to the Caribbean, some people got registered maybe four or five years after they were born. And because they got registered late, they'd have to put the date of birth as the date of registration. So I don't know. So since he was born in Al oh yeah, that was concealment. Did he deliberately conceal his true age and place of birth? Then we have the third one is fraud. Having accessed the country as an asylum seeker, did he knowingly continue to complete documentation for exceptional leave to remain, indefinite leave to remain, and naturalisation in 2005, reapplying the false information during all processes? Because that is fraud if he did it knowingly. Since he was born in Albania and not in the place where conflict was taking place, born in 1978 and not 1982, and therefore not an unaccompanied minor, would he have been successful in his application had he been honest? That is the question. Would it have made that much of a difference? And if it had, that could be the reason why he lied shouldn't be the reason why he lied, but it could be if he was aware of those circumstances. And that makes it really, really uncomfortable to think about, because if you're going to deliberately come to a country, void of any immigration papers, and then knowing the system, say that you're a certain age, and because people don't look their ages these days, say you're a certain age, and you're coming from a country where there's war when you're not, that makes it. That's why some the pe. That's why the Home Office office staff get peed off when they feel that people are deliberately taking the pee and pulling a fast one, trying to put the wall over their eyes. That's when they get peed off. 
so. And when it goes, and then not only has he um, has he found this himself in this situation, he's not only taking it to the first tier tribunal, the second tier tribunal, the third is the Supreme Court. I don't know if it's going there. But like I said, immigration relies on honesty, absence of identity papers. How do they know? When people don't look their age, do you call them a liar? When they don't have their paperwork? And when you think that in those circumstances where people are forced to relocate and are displaced, are they likely to have papers with them? Can you blame them for not having papers? And they don't speak very well. Some people have the assumption that people who don't speak English are stupid. They ain't stupid. And I think that's what pees people off. Because there's the assumption that because you don't speak English, you don't have no sense. And then these people, who you believe didn't have no sense, have pulled a fast one. If that is the case. I'm not saying it is. So did he think that because his application was made 22 years ago, that would that they would not make a connection or check original documents? I'm only saying that if this was a calculated move. Um... This is the asylum seeker's claim that his parents were relocated to Kosovo and he didn't want and they didn't want to tell him that he was born in Albania because Albanians were being killed. He came to the UK in 1998 and claimed asylum. He gave his date of birth as 11th of April 1982, making him 15. And the significance of his age, like I said, meant he was an unaccompanied minor. Was this a calculated and premeditated decision? The outcome, he was deprived of citizenship. <clears throat> like I said, I'm not sure if, um, he's going, if he's taking it to the Supreme Court, but he may have exhausted maybe his money or his options because I think... You know, it's going to be very, very difficult in the circumstances. But I'm telling you this, I'm sharing this video with you because, you know, for people who have come here fraudulently, you might get away with it for a while. But like that gentleman, it took him wanting to get married. That got him found out. If he'd kept his little butt quiet, satisfied and maybe lived with the woman, not claimed anything, not had to raise his ugly head, not his ugly head, but raise himself and put himself under the spotlight. He could have been living here fraudulently, a, if he is fraudulent, fraudulently a citizen, a citizen for goodness knows how long till he passed away. Nobody would have been none the wiser. But he wanted a wife. He wanted to be comfortable. And a girlfriend obviously wasn't enough, but I guess... With the woman in Albania. I wonder what would have happened if he'd gone over there to marry her. But maybe he wouldn't have been able to bring her. I, I, I don't know. No point kind of thinking what if. But anyway, that's all for now. Bye bye.